let's open up our Bibles, the book of uh, 2 Samuel, as we started 2 Samuel last time we were together, so we want to pick it up here in verse 1. Now, you remember that King Saul has died, and uh, of course, much of the military is in disarray, but the commander of the, of the Israeli army, he, he survived. And uh, he no doubt is putting together a semblance of what the military uh, used to be like. And uh, so here, here we've got David. Now David is, he's the new guy. He's the king that's going to be ushered in here. But of course that's not going to run all that smooth. Now David, or rather Saul, has a son that survived him. And you really, you really wonder about this guy, right? Because this guy, this guy's 40 years old. We're going to be told here in just a moment. And so you got Saul, you got dad, and you got all your brothers. They're, they're killed in this conflict. So it's like, where was this guy at? Right? So it probably doesn't speak too high of uh, this guy's uh, character, if you will. Now, his name is Ishbosheth. Now, Ishbosheth, it means man of, of shame. Now, why in the world would a dad name his little baby boy? You know, man, man of shame. It's believed that it became known as that. Because in Chronicles, First Chronicles, both in chapter 8 and in chapter 9, we read that Ner begat Kish, Kish begat Saul, and Saul begat Jonathan, Malachi Shua, and Abinadab, and Ish Baal, or man of Baal. In fact, we've, we've actually found pottery that's got this guy's name on it. Now, we would think to ourselves, all right, now, we know that Baal or Baal, well, that's, that's a bad god. So why in the world would Saul have named his son man of Baal? Why, why would he name him that? Well, what we have to remember is that at the time that Saul would have named his son that, uh, ba- Baal or Baal, it, j- it, just, meant, it just meant God. It, you know, it's somebody says to you, well, I, I believe in God. Well, okay, well, we got to define terms a little bit. I mean, you know, who or what uh, are you calling God? God? God is a very broad term. It's a generic term. And that's the way it was with Baal. So when he named his son this, he just named him uh, just man of God. It was just a, a general term. So it was a great name when the kid was named. But what happened, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, when Jezebel attempted in the ninth century BC to introduce Israel to her Phoenician cult of Baal in opposition to the official worship of Yahweh, this is when it became a negative term. So apparently 2 Samuel was written at a much later date, and it was written at a date when the term Baal was already considered to be a negative term, something of shame. So they use Ishbosheth instead of uh, Ishbaal as just communicating, hey, we we don't believe in this Baal guy, all right? So you've got this one son that's left over. You've got the commander of the army, Abner, now remember, Abner is ticked off at David. Now we're going to see next time we're together, Abner knows, he knows in his heart of hearts that David was the man that God desired to have on the throne. But Abner is going to be an example of a man who fights the will of God. He knows the will of God and he's going, he's going to fight it. And you remember that he's ticked off at David, why? Because David challenged him and embarrassed him before all of his guys. You remember that David snuck into the camp of Saul, took his spear, took his water canteen, and then he got in a high advantage place and he yelled out, he called out, Abner, Abner, what in the world are you doing sleeping on the job? Your job is to protect your boy. Why don't you just fall on your own sword? You deserve to die the way that you have handled your responsibility before the king. I mean, you talk about embarrassing a guy, calling a guy out. And I'm sure this has been eating at Abner for a long, long time. And now all of a sudden his boss is gone 
and I am not going to allow that creep that called me out to become king. I'm not going to give him a, a freeway to the throne, so to speak. So he grabs a hold of the surviving son of Saul, and he's going to set him up to be king. Now, why, why is the path to the throne so difficult for David? I mean, after all, David was chosen by God. After all, it's God's will for him to be to the throne. Why is this such a difficult path? Well, we're going to see next week, David is living in a very contrary way to the will of God. And when we live contrary to the will of God in our life, we are going to discover that our way is hard. Our way is difficult. When we walk in a way which is pleasing to the Lord, the Lord promised that even our enemies would be at peace with us. So chapter two is describing now this difficult way that is before David. So beginning in verse one, we read that it happened uh, that, uh, th that David uh, had inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up uh, to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Well, where do I go up? And he said uh, to Hebron. Now again, the strength of David's life and what gave David a leg up over Saul is that Saul was one who would continually lean into his own understanding, but David was a man of prayer. David was a man that sought God. Now remember, we just come out of about a year and a half period of time of David's life where David, he, he was calling his own shots. He was allowing himself to be a man of compromise. He did miss uh, the will of God. And things went horribly off the rails for him. He's learned his lesson. After about a year and a half of things just going south in your life, it's made an impact on this guy. So this guy, no doubt, he's got a New Year's resolution. I am not going to do anything unless God tells me to do it. And so he says, all right, now, Lord, here I am. Saul is now dead. Should I stay in Philistine territory? Do you want me to continue to live where, where I'm at? Uh, should I go back to Israel? And the Lord says, yeah, go back to Israel. And now, again, David, he doesn't even choose the town that he's going to go to. All right, where should, should, should I go? And the Lord says, now I want you to go to Hebron. So what the Lord has asked him to do is that he's now traveled mainly east, slightly north. Uh, you're talking about maybe a, a dozen miles from Ziklag. Where is that? He's about 20 miles uh, south of Jerusalem. Hebron, for the first seven and a half years of David's uh, kingship, if you will. Hebron is the capital, not Jerusalem. Uh, we're going to learn when we get into chapter 5 that Jerusalem is still being held by the Jebusites. Now, Israel has been in the land for hundreds of years. This lets us understand the depth of compromise that was going on in the lives of God's people. It was hundreds of years ago that Joshua led them in there. They defeated the enemy from north to south. All of the tribes then broke apart and they were to go into their territories for what we would think of as mopping up operations. And we can see that every single tribe of Israel has failed. No single tribe has taken everything that God had for them. It's not until, and we're going to see in chapter 5, it's not until they make David king that victory begins to take place in their life. The same thing is true in our lives, brothers and sisters. It is not until we make our heavenly David, the Lord Jesus Christ, king of our life, that these ancient adversaries, these long-standing weaknesses in our life begin to break apart and we begin to walk in victory when we make him king. And so he prays, should I go up? And, he, and the Lord says, yes, go up to Hebron. This is where the man's recovery begins. It begins in Hebron. Hebron means fellowship. Fellowship is key. You show me a brother or sister in Christ that deliberately removes themselves from fellowship, and I will probably show you a person that in a very short period of time is gonna move from a place of passion to a place of lukewarmness. 
You show me a person that is hungry for fellowship, desires to be with brothers and sisters, desires to talk about the things of God, to pray with one another, to encourage one another, and that is a person that is walking in victory. And so David, I want you to go to Hebron. You go to fellowship. Now notice in verse four, the men of Judah, they came. And they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, the men of Jabesh Gilead, they were the ones who buried Saul. Now notice, David is not power hungry. David doesn't come back in Israel and begin to campaign, right? He's not, he's not a politician. He is just simply walking in the steps uh, that God is leading him in. God said, go to Hebron. He goes to Hebron. And so now the elders of Judah, they take it upon themselves. There's no no indication here that God, or or that David was, uh, you know, politicking at all. They, on their own initiative, they come down and they anoint David uh, to be king. Now David, for the first seven and a half years of his kingship, he's only going to be king over this one single tribe. And so all of the tribes in the north. So, so what develops is, is that you've got loyalty in the south to David, and all of the tribes in the north are very slow uh, at coming to the party or coming to the inauguration, um, if, if, if you will. And uh, they, they tell David that it was Jabesh Gilead uh, that had, uh, you know, hazarded their own lives. They went to retrieve the body of Saul, um, of course, being threatened by the Philistines, and they gave him a, a proper burial. And uh, so David was probably, had asked them, well, what happened to the bodies of, of Jonathan? What happened to the bodies of Saul? Well, hey, those guys at Jabesh Gilead, wow, what in the world? They, they really hazarded their lives for what they, they did. They showed great respect uh, for the king. So, so there's this tension, all right? Of all of, all of the people in the north, those who would have been most loyal to Saul would have been Jabesh Gilead. So you've got this family. I mean, that's what Israel is. They're a big family, big extended family. And so there's tension now in the family. The north, they do not want David. They are staying loyal to the house of Saul. They don't want the house of David. And so David now, how does he walk this line? How does he deal with family members that don't, want him or don't understand the will of God for his life. And again, imagine all of the things that were said. Imagine all of the propaganda that the government was putting out and talking about, well, David is this and David is that. And no doubt the men of Jabesh Gilead had heard these stories. David's a bad guy. What in the world are you making David king for? Well, notice now how David handles this. And this is so important because we deal with this in each of our lives all of the time. Notice in verse five, and so David, he sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead, and he said unto them, you are blessed of the Lord, for you have shown the kindness to your Lord, to Saul, and have buried him. And now may the Lord show kindness and truth, boy, kindness is important, but truth is important too, kindness and truth to you, I also will repay Uh, you this kindness because you have done this thing. Now, therefore, uh, let the hands, your hands be strengthened, be valiant, and your master Saul is dead, and also the house of Judah has anointed me a king over uh, them. And so what, what do you do when there's this tension going on? So you've got David now, he's way in the south in Hebron, and you've got the, the guys, and, and these guys would have been chief among all of those in the north who were loyal to the house of Saul. So he's got to win them over. Now, you're going to notice that David does not use force. Now, what do you do when you have to approach the offended? What does David do? How does he handle this situation? This situation happens all the time in life where offenses will come in the church, offenses will come in, in our family, offenses will come in your place of work. So, so how, do you, how do you handle these? What does David do? Notice the first thing that he does is that he took the initiative in contacting them. You know how we are. Uh, we will fold our arms 
and we'll say, well, they know where to find me if they want to talk, right? I'm not, I'm not going to initiate any communication here. That's, that's not uh, the path that David took, nor is that the path that Jesus Christ lays out for us. Jesus says to us, if you have offended your brother, you go to them. If you know that your brother is offended with you, you go to them. So whether you are the offender or the offendee, according to Jesus Christ, it is our responsibility to take that initial step. Hey, I know they got a problem with me. I really need to get together with them. We need to talk this out. We need to, we need to get this right. And so here's David. He's not, he's not gonna wait for them to come around. Uh, he's gonna go. So he starts this. He initiates the conversation. How does the conversation begin? Again, he pays them a sincere compliment. He doesn't go into the room blasting with his six guns. You're an idiot. You're a jerk. You offended me. You know, you're believing lies. Why are you so gullible? Why are you so naive? None of that. He begins by saying, you know what you guys did was a great thing. It was a wonderful thing. You gave that guy uh, the respect uh, that he deserved as, as being king. And I, I pray that God blesses you. And then notice, not only does he pray that God would bless them, but he said, I'm, I'm going to bless you. If, you know, I, I, got, I want God to bless you, and I want you to be blessed so much that I'm, I'm going to ble uh, bless you. So these guys are adversaries, and yet David is taking that position that I'm gonna, I'm gonna really need to do something here to just show you guys how much I appreciate what you did uh, for the former king. And then notice how he indirectly reminds them that he was the Lord's uh, anointed. Oh, by the way, you know, P.S., you know, um, Judah has anointed me uh, as, as king. Now you, you do with that information, what, whatever you, you want to do with it. Notice that David is not a bull in a china shop. Notice that, that, that this is a young guy now that has been given new authority. You see this all the time. Don't you? you see it in your place of work. Somebody gets promoted to a position. They now have new authority. They don't have the character to really handle that authority. They begin to overstep. They begin to be abusive. They begin to you know, be demanding and so forth. Uh, this is not David. But David is pretty chill, isn't he? He's the new king, and yet he's not throwing his weight around. Now, again, as, as I say, next time we get together, it's going to be very clear that many in the north knew that David was to be king. But they're refusing, for whatever reason. I'm sure it was for selfish reasons. Uh, they were refusing to submit to that idea, and they wanted the house of Saul uh, to stay in, in business. Now, Arnold Anderson, he puts it this way. He said, one could almost say that the first century, the, the first recorded act of the new king of Judah was to offer friendship and comfort to a group of Israelites with the implication that David may be Judean, but his heart belongs to all of Israel. So guys, I'm, I'm not being a jerk. I'm not forcing myself. I just, look, I'm just, I, I want the best for the nation. So, so David is certainly taking the high road here when it comes to managing these political relationships, if you will, which can be, as we know, very tricky. Well, then notice, in, so great things are going on, but notice great things are going on in your life. There's always a but, right? There's always a but there to mess things up. And uh, we find the but here in verse 8. But Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, he took Ishbosheth, and uh, the son of Saul, and he brought him over to Mahanaim, and he made him king over Gilead, over the Asherites, over Jezreel, over Ephraim, over Benjamin, in fact, over all of Israel. And Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel. But note, very short reign. He only reigned uh, two years. Only the house of Judah followed David. And uh, the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah uh, was seven years and six months. So David, he's going to reign uh, for a total of, of uh, 40 years 
but the first seven years or so, it's just over one of the tribes. And then 30, 33 years, he'll reign over all of, uh, of Israel. And we'll get into that in uh, chapter five. Now, Abner is, is no doubt offended, and so he's putting together a refugee government, if you will. Now, again, he goes even farther east by establishing uh, the new king. Now, again, what's going on in Israel? You've got this massive invasion of the Philistines. Uh, their army is in shambles. They've just had an incredible defeat. They're at Mount Gilbo. And so no doubt, for safety purposes, he moves the army uh, farther away from the territory of, uh, of Israel. And as I say, no doubt for, uh, for safety. Um, it's interesting that um, um, uh, Warren Wiersbe says, uh, there's a modern touch to this scenario. For our political and religious worlds are populated by these same three kinds of people. We have weak people like Ishbosheth, who gets where they are because they have connections. We have strong, selfish people like Abner who know how to manipulate others for their own personal profit. And then we also have people of God like David who are called and anointed and equipped but must wait for God's time uh, before they, they can serve. So here's David. He's cool with it. He's not freaking out, but he knows God is in charge. And when it's God's time, God's going to bring this, this all to pass. And so... Um, we're now, we're now introduced to, I think, three, well, particularly two, uh, really fascinating guys. Now, what, what happens here is that Abner, uh, no doubt, is, is looking for some kind of maybe a mutual uh, defense tr uh, treaty. Um, let, let's get together and let's talk. And so there's a meeting uh, around a, 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 big, a big pool of, uh, uh, of water. And, uh, and uh, they're going to, Abner has his forces on one side, David's got uh, his forces um, on, a, on another side. And uh, we're told in verse 13, and Joab, uh, the son of Zariah, and uh, the servants of David, uh, they went out to meet them by the pool of Gibeon, so that they sat down one on one side of the pool and uh, the other on the other side of the pool. Then notice in verse 18. Now the three sons of Zariah, uh, they were Joab, Abishai, and uh, Ashel. And Ashel, notice, was as fleet a foot as a wild uh, gazelle. Now these three brothers were the sons of David's sister. All right, so these three boys are David's three nephews. Now, I don't know what went on genetically between David's sister and uh, her husband, uh, but she produced uh, three certified uh, whack jobs. Uh, these, these three uh, guys are as crazy and as insane uh, as they come. And they're going to be taking up a major part of the story. They're going to play, well, at least two of them, because we're going to see uh, Ashiel is going to be killed here. Uh, we're going to see that the, the two, Abishai and Joab, uh, they kind of take over the military uh, of David. And they are going to be there uh, through all, or, or at least Joab is going to be there uh, through his entire administration. These are just crazy insane. These are, these are killers. Uh, Joab particularly was just a terminator, and uh, he was just an uncontrollable uh, killer. And Abishai was basically uh, the same thing. I, I picture these guys, if you're UFC fans, uh, you know, Nick and Nate Diaz, they're just crazy. They're just nuts. And I really, I really view that's how these two guys are. They're just insane. Now, they meet around the pool of Gibeon. Now, this is, this is a picture of, of um, an archaeological work at Gibeon. I believe it was from 1920, 1922. This is what the pool uh, looks like today. A description of the pool is this, that the pool is a, a cylindric shaft 37 feet in diameter, 35 feet deep, 
It's five feet wide spiral staircase, stairway of 79 steps, which winds downward the side, the inside wall of the pool in a clockwise direction. It continues below the floor level, uh, b- below the floor, floor, floor level and an additional depth of 45 uh, feet. So it's this, it's this huge pool. And so you've got, you got Abner and his guys and you got Joab and his guys on, on the other side. Now, Abner, for whatever reason, I, I would imagine that Joab was probably talking trash. That's just how I view Joab. And uh, Abner said, well, you know, let's, let's make it interesting, shall we? Why don't we, why don't we let some of the young guys uh, duke it out? Let's have a little, let's have a little fight here. And uh, things get out of hand, and people start dropping dead. And uh, but before you know it, it's an all-out sword fight, and lots of people now are being killed, and Abner uh, begins to get the worst of it. And so Abner uh, begins to run for his life. Now, we're told here uh, that uh, Ashahel uh, was as fleet as a gazelle. Now, the ancient historian uh, Josephus, he tells us that Ashahel, uh, who was the most eminent of them, Uh, He was very famous for his swiftness of foot, for he could not only be too hard for men, but he is reported to have outrun a horse uh, when they had raced together, all right? So this is is a fast guy. This is is Usain Bolt, all right? And uh, so he decides, hey, you know, Abner's head would look pretty good in my trophy case, right? I I wanna cut off the head. And so he goes after Abner. Now, Abner sees that this guy's running after him, and Abner says, hey, boy, uh, go home. Uh, You you are going after uh, the wrong guy. I don't want to bring harm. If I bring harm to you, I know what your nutty brothers are going to be doing, all right? So just, just go. You go fight somebody else. And he wouldn't. He wouldn't stop. And so finally, uh, the old veteran stopped, and he killed him. And then he, he took off running. Now, Abner ends up on high ground, and reinforcements show up for him. And so Abishai and Joab, they're running after Abner, and they come across the body of their dead brother. And now they, you thought they were nuts before, uh, now they are totally, verifiably uh, nuts. And uh, they track down Abner, and Abner Uh, He shouts to them from the high ground. So Abner's got the high ground. Abner now has reinforcements. And he yells out to John, look, there's been enough killing today. Let's Let's just back off. Let's just call it quits. And Joab, I think he assesses the situation. And he wisely says, all right. So he backs away. But notice in verse 13, and Joab and uh, the son of Zariah and the servants of David... Uh, that they went out, uh, or uh, what, am I, what am I talking about? Verse 30. And uh, so Joab, he returned uh, from after uh, pursuing Abner. And uh, when they had gathered all of the people together uh, that were missing of David's servants, there were 19 men and uh, Ashel. So they lost 20 guys. But the servants of David had struck down a Benjamin and Abner's men, 360 men. Who died, and then they took up Ashiel and they buried him in their father's tomb, uh, which was in Bethlehem. Again, David, was, his family was from Bethlehem, and these are his nephews, and so they're burying their they're dead there too. And Joab and his men, uh, they went all night, and they came to Hebron uh, at uh, daybreak. So uh, this was, um, you know, just a, an atrocity uh, that had taken place. Uh, you, th- again, as I say, this is family. Right? They're, all, they're all related. They all, they all go back to Father Abraham here. And uh, you can see uh, the veracity of uh, David's uh, fighting men. Again, these guys, they have, they have been living some tough lives you know, for the last 15 years. Right? They've been out in the wilderness. They have been chased. They've been, they've been fighting you know, the Amalekites. They have been living next to the Philistines. I mean, these are junkyard dogs. And now all of a sudden they come up against the northern army and they lose 20. Northern army loses 360. So when David will eventually get to listing his mighty men, 
you begin to understand uh, these were warriors, uh, these, these were tough guys. But this was not the will of God. Now, you, you, look, at, you look at David, we're, we're going to see particularly next week, David is still in the midst of his struggle. And you got Abner here. He's got his issues. You've got Joab. He's got his issues. And so all of this garbage that is going on, it's all being created by men who have issues. I love what uh, uh, Walter uh, Chantry says. Self-denial corrects two evil tendencies ever attacking Christian ethics There is a tendency to give more attention to the outward standards than the inward state of the heart. And there is a tendency to be strict with others and lenient with oneself. These two dragons are slain by the sword of self-denial when their heads appear in the land of Christian liberty. How many times do we see struggles in our marriage Do we see struggles in our church? Do we see struggles in the workplace where you get men and women together who, you know, one sees it one way and the other sees it the other way and there is no desire to just stop and just say, well, okay, I know what I want and I know what you want, but maybe we ought to find out what is it that God wants Maybe we ought to be seeking the will of the Lord. And we see in all of this heartache, in all of this dysfunction that's going on, nobody stops and says, let's stop the madness here, all right? And let's seek God on this one. I think a great exhortation that we need to take from this story is that we've got all this dysfunction that runs in and through our lives, that we should take a moment and say, Lord, help me to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow you. What does self-denial look like in this marriage situation? What does self-denial look like in this church situation, in this work situation? Lord, would you reveal to my heart what you want me to do in this situation? What, reveal to us what you, your outcome is to look like. So I think as we go to prayer, we need to be praying, oh Lord, help us to deny ourselves. And Father, we ask that, uh, Lord, we would learn these lessons that we see in Joab and Abner and David. They were just real guys, and they allowed their flesh nature to get the best of them at times. And Lord, would you help us, wherever the conflicts are right now, in our marriages, family, or neighborhoods, wherever, Lord, would you help us to manage those conflicts in a way which would honor you? That, Father, rather than just being so determined to get our will done, we would take a moment to just seek you to find out what is your will in this situation. And then give us the grace, Father, to submit to your will. Give us the grace to admit we're wrong. Give us the grace to forgive Give us the grace just to give one another a break. Lord, life is hard. And I ask, Father, that we would deal with each other in a compassionate manner. Help us, Father, to forgive even as the Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.